Well, good morning. Um, for this part of, of this uh, seminar, uh, I'm going to make just a few comments here just for a few minutes. And uh, to do that, uh, what I want to do is I want to jump right into the world of, of bioethics. Uh, as, um, as Dr. Baker uh, alluded to, both uh, Dr. Thompson and I uh, have done some graduate work at uh, Trinity International University. One of the first questions we get is, what actually is bioethics? And this by no means is an exhaustive list of all things that bioethics can intersect with. Uh, you could really make entire semester-long courses genuinely about any of these particular topics. Uh, what I'd like to do just for a few moments this morning is uh, steer the conversation towards uh, beginning of life issues, uh, things uh, from a technology standpoint that we're doing with uh, life at its very earliest stages. So uh, things related to like reproductive technologies, uh, stem cells, things of that nature. So it's been recognized since the 1950s with the uh, development of what we now refer to as in vitro fertilization, that ethics has been part of this discussion now for decades. And uh, I'm not here this morning to talk specifically about in vitro fertilization. I'm sure that's, again, worth an entire seminar in and of itself. But the two people who get the credit for developing this technology are Dr. Robert Edwards and Dr. Patrick Steptoe. And the reason I mention that, uh, one of them uh, is a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, the reason I mention that is when the issue of ethics was recognized at the very early um, at the dawn of the development of this technology. Uh, in the words of, of Dr. Edwards, uh, they saw ethics, in their own words, as involving safety issues relevant to patients and children, but in their own words, not necessarily issues uh, based on vague religious or political reasons. Um, also, uh, what Dr. Edwards uh, claimed is he claimed that he thought that all of the ethical considerations uh, should be only considered by the scientists uh, in those respective fields. Uh, and, and again, in their words, not politicians or religi religious leaders. Uh, Dr. Thompson has heard me say this actually more than once, so what I'm going to say next is not going to come as any surprise to him. But uh, being a member of the scientific community, uh, I'm a trained biochemist. Uh, my PhD is in biochemistry and molecular biology. And I don't mind to tell you that I respectfully disagree with that claim by Dr. Edwards. I welcome the discussion and the input from the theologians and the philosophers. I think if there's anything that bioethics should entail, is it should entail a multidisciplinary, uh, multi-voice approach to wrestle with the issues that we're wrestling with today here in modern times. Which gets me to this one te technology, this one technique. I decided to pick something that maybe you have a peripheral awareness of. Uh, how many people, show of hands, I'm not going to count, and this is not like a survey, but how many people have heard of Dolly the Sheep? Uh, you've heard of Dolly the Sheep. Okay, if you've heard of Dolly the Sheep, then you're aware of this technology because Dolly the Sheep uh, was developed using uh, a similar somatic cell nuclear transfer. Uh, somatic for the Greek word soma of, of the body. So uh, just one, uh, one image, and then I've got one video to show you what this really looks like. Imagine that you have uh, two embryos, okay? and I don't mind to, to say it this way. Uh, some people would say human embryos, uh, but since I believe uh, for biblical reasons that life begins at conception, from here, this point forward, I'm going to say embryonic humans. Yeah, I realize if you're not used to that, uh, that probably comes as sort of a bit of a pause to you. But I do believe that life begins at conception. So I don't think that, that human is the, um, how should I say it? Uh, you guys, you're adult humans. You are adolescent humans. Uh, I think uh, using that same logic, I think in utero, you're an embryonic human. So I think human's the noun, not the adjective. So in this day and age, last year, United Kingdom, what they allowed, and actually children, they say, will be born this year using this technology. So I want to explain this technology very quickly. Uh, on the left, <clears throat> excuse me, on the left, imagine that you have two cells, okay, so the nice circles are, are two respective cells, they could be embryos, okay, one could be an embryo, one could be maybe an egg, for example. The smaller circles inside of those, those are the respective nuclei, or the nucleus for each embryo, and then the ovals inside of each of those, those represent the mitochondria, okay, so I kid you not, to understand what's going on here, all you really have to have is a high school understanding of biology. If you've heard of mitochondria, and you've heard of a nucleus, and heard of a cell, you can be conversational about what this technology entails. As it turns out, 
Uh, this may also come as a bit of a shock if you haven't heard this before, uh, and I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but you may not know this, but for human biology, the, the DNA that's in all of your mitochondria, you got solely from your mother. Okay? The DNA in your mitochondria comes only from your mother. It's the DNA in the nucleus that's half and half. Okay? So in the, nuclear, in the nucleus DNA, which is an overwhelming majority, now they're saying somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 25,000 genes, uh, the number is still, um, I guess, being decided or debated. Nobody's come up with an actual number, but they say about 20, 25,000 genes. In the mitochondria, there are only 37 genes. Okay? And those 37 genes in the mitochondria, they're important. So very quickly now, as I've set the preface, what, what's happening now in this day and age is that you can actually take the nuclei out of both embryos. And what you can do is at the top, what I did is I color, colored that oval, sort of like a, a lighter green. I realize that probably it's a different color on the, the, the screen. But imagine that the mitochondria on the top left, that oval on the top left, maybe there's something wrong with it where there's some disease that relates to it. But what you really want to do is you want to take the DNA in the nucleus and you want to save that. You want to carry it forward. So what you do is you basically pull the nuclei out of both embryos and what you do is you take the nucleus of the one that you want to save and then you insert it into the other embryo that has healthy mitochondria which is on the bottom that's the mitochondria that the that is the solid green okay so the solid green mitochondria are the good or the healthy mitochondria so there are lots of issues with this that relate to personhood uh, I'll let my colleague Dr. Thompson unpackage this a little bit better um, but you have issues of, do you start with two human lives and you end up with one human life? Uh, you also hear in the news uh, three-person embryos. That's where that comes from because the DNA and that donor mitochondria did come from uh, an additional woman from a third person. Uh, this is not meant to be a biochemistry lecture, but just to make my case that the 37 genes in the mitochondria, they are very important. All of these phenomena, you have to have this uh, in order to support life as you know it. Uh, I've got a quick video here just to show you what this actually looks like in, in real life. This is from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, uh, I want you to see this uh, in their own words. This video is prepared by my colleagues Dieter Egli and Kevin Egan. And you see here on the left is a, what's called a holding pipette, which gently sucks on the egg. The egg is surrounded by a membrane called the zona. And you'll watch this pipette on the right first drill a hole into the zona, then go in and suck the nucleus out and then another nucleus which has been taken from say a somatic cell, a cell of the body, is going to be put in. So if we could start the video please. You'll see now that this drilling pipette is going to suck, drill a little hole into the membrane. You can maybe see a little bit of the hole right here at the next part. This pipette you'll note isn't really sharp like a syringe. There you can see a bit of the hole. And now the pipette's going to go in and remove the nucleus. And if you look carefully in the pipette, you'll see a line in the nucleus, which are all the chromosomes lined up. So that nucleus is going to be squirted out now because we don't need it anymore. And there we have an enucleated egg. Now the next step is to take a set of eggs like that, and I'll show you two, and then transfer into them a nucleus from another kind of cell, a fully differentiated somatic cell. So here the enucleated egg is set on the side that it's held by this holding pipette on the left. There's drilling the little hole in the membrane. Here we go in. Here comes the nucleus from the right. The pipette goes in and these pipettes are operated with a piezoelectric device. So you can't see it here but it's like a little jackhammer going very quickly like a Woody the Woodpecker getting in there to then squirt the nucleus in. Here we'll see it again, a little hole in the zona is prepared and now the nucleus is going to be squirted inside. So there's two, two examples of what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. All right, so just a couple of things, uh, not to take any of my colleagues' time. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, recognizes that there's a genetic linkage to parenthood. They specifically said when they developed this last year, they said that the mitochondrial donor would not have any parental rights. So if you were the third genetic contributor, you would not have any parental rights. I, I say this very guardedly, okay, and I know this is very serious, especially right here, first uh, lecture off the bat. Uh, I don't see the future very often, and I sincerely hope that I'm wrong uh, with what I'm about to say. 
but I think it's probably only a matter of time before that's contested in the courts where somebody who contributed the DNA in the mitochondria decides that they want to go to somebody's birthday party or be part of that child's life. Uh, the United Kingdom, uh, when people started uh, criticizing this in terms of just safety and some of the, the ethical issues possibly associated with it, uh, they said uh, that you really don't have three people embryos. Um, they said that you have something like a 2.999 something or other person. Um, I looked hard for any time in, in history where somebody suggested you had a fraction of a person. And being very serious, the only thing I could find is when somebody does like a demographic study where they count the number of children in a population, count the number of adults, and they would say like the average American household has two and a half children. Of course, it's just a uh, consequence of the math. Nobody really suggests that you have a fraction of a person. Uh, the United States, uh, the FDA, is considering the same technology, a panel from the National Academy of Medicine, and I'm going to wrap this up and turn this over to Dr. Thompson. Uh, they, they said more study, more thought should go into this, and I'm not going to read this to you word for word. Um, they recognize that there are potential issues, quote, of, of playing God. Uh, something, is it, is it therapeutic, or could it possibly be used to select children with certain genetic traits? Uh, if you will, eugenics. Um, the FDA said only if the following conditions can be met in their recommendations. Uh, talked about safety, first using animals, then embryos, or I would say human embryonic humans that could not grow into babies. Um, and they only wanted to use male embryos. Uh, the reason for using male embryos is because, uh, remember, men do not trans transfer their mitochondria to their children. The mitochondria that you all have came solely from your mother um, because those are what's in the egg when the egg is fertilized. So lots of issues. I could talk for quite some time about some of the issues associated with this in terms of what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a parent? Uh, does personhood begin at conception? Um, and I think uh, I will, in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Thompson. I brought other things we can talk about for those that are interested in the breakout sessions. Well, if you're like me with little science background, you have to think hard <laughs> to stay up uh, with Dennis, for whom this is uh, everyday conversation. Uh, and I appreciate so much uh, our friendship and our conversations, and I, like him, agree these have to be interdisciplinary, multi uh, disciplinary conversations. It's not the purview of science nor the purview of theology and philosophy alone. I think it's all of those uh, coming together in vigorous conversations about these issues that are uh, so, so very critical for our lives. Uh, Jurassic Park, uh, sometimes Hollywood gets it right. <laughs> And so uh, Malcolm, the scientist, when the clone dinosaurs get out of control, uh, even before that point, he objecting to uh, cloning dinosaurs and making them you know, available in a zoo-like environment said, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Well, that's the ethics question. Uh, there are a lot of things we might be able to do with technology, with scientific development. Uh, the ethicists sometimes have the reputation of getting in the way of all that progress by daring to ask the question, I know we can, but should we? And before we rush too quickly to consider the impact this will have uh, on our lives. Uh, it's not a statement against technology. I would argue technology is a good gift of God. But just to say... <laughs> Before pressing further, are there questions that need to be asked, issues that need to be considered? So uh, Dennis was exploring mainly beginning of life issues. I'm going to focus on that as well. And so we're asking questions like these. Can we produce uh, human embryos merely for the purpose of uh, experimenting on them? Uh, do we consider them as disposable research material that can be used and then destroyed even for good benefit? Uh, can we destroy human embryos for the benefit of harvesting these embryonic stem cells with all of their uh, potential uh, abilities? So I'm going to suggest that the critical question related not just to beginning of life but also to end of life issues is who is included in the moral community? Who has moral rights? Uh, who has moral values? And as philosophers see it, only uh, entities with moral uh, standing are in the moral community. And these entities are called 
her sons and uh, to appreciate from the very beginning that being human being and being person are not the same thing in the minds of many philosophers. So you might be a human being, but you may not be a person with moral rights, moral standing, uh, moral value. Uh, as Dennis had said, and I'm inclined to agree, and this is part of the friendship we share together, uh, this is not purely a scientific question or a biological question. Uh, science obviously contributes a large voice, uh, helping us to understand you know, embryological development and so on and so forth. But now the theologians and the philosophers enter the conversation to help all of us understand, well, what are the implications of this set of uh, biological or scientific facts? So there are two main views of personhood uh, that we will briefly overview. Uh, and where you uh, end up on this will determine, in my judgment, where you end up on all these issues, both beginning of life, end of life, and all of the issues in between those two uh, stages of, of human existence. So there is one set of views called uh, the developmental view or the functional views that argue to be a morally relevant person means that you have to, at the present time, be able to exercise characteristics and functionalities uh, that characterize being human. And I'll quickly uh, go over uh, two representative views in a minute. Intrinsic views are just the opposite of that. Intrinsic or ontological views say, no, 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 no. You're not a person by virtue of the capacities you can immediately exercise you're a person by virtue of the kind of being you are. And so if you're a human being, uh, that is sufficient in itself to qualify you as a person in a moral sense with value and rights and so forth. All right, two examples of a developmental view, and I think you can see quickly uh, the implications and the repercussions of these. So Michael Tooley argues that the precondition to being a person is that you are able to exhibit uh, what he calls subjectivity or self-awareness. All of you can. You are aware of self in distinction from your external environment. You understand yourself as an individual person and the person next to you as a separate individual person. So there's this sense of subjectivity and self-awareness. Uh, Tooley says the obvious. Well, fetuses aren't capable of that. Fetuses have no sense of self-awareness, and so fetuses are not persons. But he's also honest enough to admit, hey, by the way, infants do not either. Infants are not self-aware, not in the sense that you are, and probably are not until several months after pregnancy. Some tell me even a year or more after pregnancy. So Thule is not only for abortion, in all stages of pregnancy, I mean up to a week before birth as far as he's concerned, he is also in favor of the moral permissibility of infanticide, killing infants after they are born. And this is a, an awakening movement in philosophy, uh, beginning with some philosophers in Australia, it's come to Europe and it's coming to American philosophy as well. Uh, I think in your lifetime you're going to be wrestling with this. As we did Roe v. Wade, I think we're going to be wrestling with the legalization of infanticide in America. Uh, another representative of this is Marianne Warren. She says, these are the criteria that are required for you to be considered a person in a morally relevant sense. That is a person who has rights and values, even the right to live. And you see the five she lists. Uh, she does in the article say, you know, probably if you have three of the five, we could count you as a person. Uh, certainly you're a person if you have all five, but if you have less than three of these, probably not a person in a morally relevant sense. Again, she applies this to a fetus. Guess what? <laughs> the fetus at any stage in the woman's pregnancy, in her view, is not a morally relevant person with rights. You could conceivably, in her moral judgment, have an abortion the day before delivery through the vaginal canal. It's like, I'm going to have this baby tomorrow, but I could abort this baby the day before, and that would be morally permissible. Uh, this quote just always takes my breath away. If the right to life of a fetus is to be based on the resemblance to a person, then it cannot be said to have any more right to life than a newborn guppy. 
Obviously, if that applies to the fetus or it applies to the early embryos of which uh, Dr. Matlock spoke, it also applies to infants as well. Thus, these positions arguing for infanticide, in my judgment, are being logically consistent. So if you don't like where they come out, maybe back off and question some of their beginning points. So in Warren's view, here are three examples of human beings. I mean, biologically, human beings who are not moral persons with rights and values. We've already talked about the fetus. Zero moral rights, zero moral value at any stage of the pregnancy. Thule comes along, Peter Singer comes along, even after birth. Peter Singer is willing to argue that up to two years after birth, an infant still has no moral rights or values. And his favor of considering the legalization of, inf of, uh, uh, the legalization of uh, infanticide up to two years after birth. Uh, teaches at Princeton University. You know, these are not fly-by-night, you know, people. These are teaching at major universities across the world. Uh, she says defective human beings. And how she defines defective is uh, with an IQ level. Uh, I don't recall her setting it, but she means here are human beings whose IQ level is so well, they're so mentally defective, uh, they cannot be considered persons. And then a person who's had a traumatic brain injury or something like that, and they are incapable of self-awareness and consciousness at the same uh, degree that you are. So I want to suggest that these developmental views are like a bell curve view of personhood. This bell curve represents all human beings. But just because you're a human being does not mean you have more rights and privileges in their views. So you have in their views pre-persons. A pre-person could be an embryo or a fetus before birth. It could also be an infant after birth. It could be a person with serious mental challenge who will never be able to function mentally in the ways that you do. And then you could have uh, persons who, uh, you know, meet these criteria, as everyone in this room would be person in these views, but then you would have post-persons. So at the end of life, uh, these criteria that you have acquired, you now begin to lose. So you lose your mental capacity, you lose your sense of self-awareness, you lose your sense of self-distinguished from other individuals. Uh, think of your grandparents with Alzheimer's uh, disease, or think of someone with a traumatic brain injury, or think of someone, uh, you know, who is just not right in their mind. In their view, these are no longer persons because they have no more self-awareness than do these entities at the beginning of life. All right, switching gears entirely in your mind, think, 180 degree turn. The essential views argue that if you're a human being, you are a morally relevant person. All that is required for you to have moral value and moral rights is to be a member of the human family. And as Dennis is arguing uh, biologically, being a human being, a living human being, uh, we both believe uh, starts at conception. So any person, a person is any living, distinct, self-organizing, self-directive organism of the homo sapien species, no matter uh, at which <laughs> development stage they are, whether it's at conception or implantation or other uh, stages within the pregnancy or whether birth or whether through adolescence and old age and so forth, their view of personhood is more like a straight line beginning at a definitive point, conception, and lasting all the way through the various developmental stages. Uh, Robert George and Christopher Tolleson have written this wonderful book entitled <coughs> Embryo. If you want to explore this further, first book I would recommend you to read, at least if you're inclined uh, you know, to want to know more about this essential view. So they define embryo as a human embryo, as a whole living member of the species Homo sapiens in the earliest stages of his or her natural development. And you develop from the embryonic stage to the fetal stage to the now just born stage to the childhood stage to the adolescent stage and to the adult stage. Uh, I think of uh, Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You needed to be together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Pause for just a bit. 
silence and depths of the earth are being used as images for the womb. This place of silence, this place of darkness, kind of like the depths of the earth. So it's, it's functioning poetically as a description of the womb. And it makes perfect sense at a time when they couldn't see in the womb. It was the shadowy, silent place like being in the depths of the earth. The next line, so critical. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. I've given you the Hebrew word in English, golem, which you could easily, legitimately translate embryo. You have seen me in my embryonic state. Psalm 139. So I think as we wrestle with this as Christians, as theologians, uh, as believers in the teaching of Scripture, these have to be, uh, these kinds of verses have to be wrestled with. That God is aware of human beings in the womb, and in this case, aware even before formation had taken place, while it's just, some would say, a glob of uh, biological material. I saw your unformed substance. And then quickly we'll uh, address this question. When were you first you? Uh, you exist, you're an individual person, you have a history, you have relationships. When were you first you? Well, that doesn't look like you, <laughs> but as Dr. Uh, Matlock, the scientist, is pointing out, we all began that way. We all began as a fertilized ovum that by self-directed processes uh, continued through um, predictable embryological development, became a born baby, then a toddler, and so on and so forth. You all began life that way. That's what you look like at that stage. That's of what you look like at that stage of development. Those are the capacities you have at that stage of development. You know, we don't expect you to look like a newborn baby at that stage, nor to do advanced calculus at that stage. You're doing what a, an embryonic human being does at that stage. All right, I will end personally. This is a view of my granddaughter Ella in the womb. Is that not cool, <laughs> what technology allows? And I'm going to argue that theologically, philosophically, there's a continuity of personal existence from the very earliest days of our life to the end of our life, and I would argue all the way through eternity. So this is Ella through the years. Uh, she was uh, in my daughter Shannon's womb. She is now a little toddler, and she's growing up a very beautiful young lady, if I might add. And uh, here is one of the most recent pictures of her. My point is simply that that Ella is the same Ella who is in my daughter Shannon's womb. It's not a different person, a different identity, a different uh, you know, existence. It is the same person at a different stage of their life. Wish we had time to talk about this, but we don't, so I'll end with this. Uh, none of us in this room were ever a sperm or an egg. A sperm or an egg can only be a sperm or an egg until conception takes place. And once conception takes place, you have, you know, a new genetic code, you have a new uh, personal identity, you have all of the potential necessary to develop into a whole human being. So none of us were ever a sperm or an egg, but every one of us were once an embryo, an infant, a toddler, a teenager, a young college student, and really old dude, as in my case. And I'll close by reminding us, and I hope this uh, impresses you, be reminded Jesus himself was once an embryo in Mary's womb was once a fetus. The incarnation did not begin with the birth in Bethlehem. The incarnation began when Jesus was in Mary's womb.